Well, hello, welcome to Shop Talk with Yonder Studio. My name is Nathan Yoder, and I'm going to be spending some time uh, today talking about wood engraving. Um, uh, I'm going to try to cover kind of the basics of things today, so I'm going to move pretty fast, try to move fast through um, a lot of what we'll be covering today. And uh, hopefully in the future, maybe I'll come back and uh, cover some cover some of uh, the specifics of uh, what we're going to be dealing with um, today uh, in greater detail in those uh, specific areas. So, um, so yeah, just to get right to it, um, I wanted to start by focusing or uh, spending a bit of time looking at kind of the background of wood engraving uh, before we'll then move into talking about some materials, the different uh, kind of woods and tools that are used. And um, then hopefully at the end, move into actually working on a wood engraving and um, showing a little bit of the process and um, sharing some tips, general tips on uh, how that goes about. So let's see here. So wood engraving uh, really can kind of be traced back or is oftentimes credited to Thomas Buick, uh, who was the son of a goldsmith back in, I think, around the 1800s or so. And uh, so what, what he did really was to take, you know, the tools that he was using in his, you know, father's workshop, these tools used for engraving into jewelry and things like that, and started using them on end grain blocks of boxwood, which is a really dense hardwood uh, that, you know, he was able to achieve a lot of detail um, with. And so, again, using jeweler's tools, you know, cutting into this hard wood, he was able to then, you know, create some these illustrations that um, really kind of set off wood engraving as a medium. And from there, uh, it began being used commercially in, uh, you know, books and um, uh, you know, catalogs and um, magazines um you know eventually there were you know whole kind of workshops you know filled with wood engravers working on you know illustrations again for books and magazines and catalogs um because really you know until later advances in printing technology this was the only real way to uh you know get an illustration into a book you know in print uh before this uh woodcuts were the way of um, reproducing illustrations in a book, uh, which is a little bit of a different process. A lot of times, um, woodcut and uh, engraving gets kind of mixed up. And uh, really, it comes down to just two different kinds of tools. Um, you know, the Japanese, uh, you know, they, they're using knives, uh, you know, and kind of cutting into the wood. Um, Typically, what you're seeing when people are referring to woodcuts are more like gouge type of tools that you would see um, similar to those that you might see if you're familiar with linoleum uh, cutting. But uh, we'll get into the tools here in just a little bit, but wood engraving tools are, are a bit different. So again, uh, if you're interested in you know reading up a little bit more on the history of wood engraving, this is a great article that I recently came across um, called uh, The Graver, The Brush, and The Ruling Machine. And um, yeah, just lots of really great stuff in there that I, that I, I really kind of wasn't aware of before. Um, you know, wood engraving as a commercial sort of industry, uh, it flared up and went away pretty fast uh, just because there was a lot going on around that time, you know, kind of it being around the time of the Industrial Revolution. And so a lot of the, um, th there's very little that I can kind of find, you know, uh, about wood engraving in these workshops. Um, there's even a machine called a ruling machine that you can kind of see uh, the, the man there on the left is uh, using. And um, that was used to achieve just very precise, you know, parallel lines. Um, and uh, so anyways, there, there, there are lots of really interesting things um, you know, to be uh, to be found in that article specifically, and I've linked to it in the show notes down below. So some notable uh, engravers of the past, you know, again, Thomas Buick is uh, who I mentioned at the very beginning. 
Um, George Mackley is uh, another wood engraver uh, from the UK. Uh, I don't believe he's alive anymore, but uh, just really love his work. Um, uh, Asa Shafetz, if I'm pronouncing that right, is a, another really great wood engraver from around the 20s, I believe is when he was engraving. Um, just really great stuff. And uh, so you can kind of see here, you know, a range of styles, um, you know, uh, each one is, you know, fairly detailed, you know, it gives you an idea of the, the kinds of detail that you can get out of uh, the wood engraving kind of medium. Some contemporary wood engravers uh, that I really enjoy. I mean, I, I could just go on and on listing different wood engravers, but uh, these are some contemporaries that uh, are doing some really great work. Um, Peter Brown, uh, he's a wood engraver in the UK. I only recently came across his work, but I've really been enjoying the work that he's putting out. Um, Wesley Bates is another really excellent wood engraver. Uh, he's been doing it for a while and um, I actually came across his work first uh, because he did some engravings for a documentary on Wendell Berry, the poet. And uh, the whole documentary is kind of sprinkled with these wood engravings by Wesley Bates. And it's just uh, really, really beautiful stuff. Um, and then also Howard Phipps, uh, is, a, is another wood engraver in the UK. I'm not sure exactly where, and I hope I'm getting that right. But uh, his work, I mean, I just really love uh, the work of Howard Phipps. He's just got such a great, um, I don't know, it, he's just really a master of the medium. So uh, anyways, I just thought I'd share a few wood engravers that I enjoy just to give you an idea of you know what's possible uh, in working with wood engraving. Let's see. Let's let's talk a little bit about um, the blocks. So, you know, the block being kind of the most important part. You know, of course, it's what you're you're engraving into. So there there are several different types of woods that you can use uh, for a wood engraving. So boxwood, I mentioned earlier, is kind of the, I think I mentioned earlier, is, is, is the ideal sort of wood. That was the wood that uh, wood engraving started with. Um, and I personally have never tried boxwood. It's a little bit hard to come by. And uh, because of that, it's, it's fairly expensive. Um, but uh, another good alternative to boxwood is maple. And so you know, you can find maple fairly easily. Um, you know, you don't even, uh, you know, you can you can buy maple blocks that are pre-made and prepared at uh, different printing, um, printmaking shops and online stores. Uh, what I've been doing lately is just been going down to, you know, whatever local woodworking store that you might have and buying a, um, a large block of maple that's prepared for turning, for wood turning, if you're you know, aware of, you know, people turning bowls and things like that on a lathe, you can get a big chunk of maple and then you, you can take it home if you've got a saw or, you know, if you, you know, know anybody who has a wood, wood shop, you know, they can chop them down into little blocks for you. Um, and so that's something that I've been doing because, you know, if you do it that way, once you do the math, um, you know, this block is maybe going to cost you a couple bucks compared to if you're buying a pre-made uh, block specifically prepared for wood engraving, you know, a block like this might cost you around 15 bucks. Another thing to keep in mind, though, if you are preparing your own blocks, if you're ever going to take your wood engravings to a letterpress shop and, uh, you know, have them printed there, you want to make sure that your blocks are what is called type high, which is a specific measurement, you know, for fitting a block into um, a letterpress machine or um, or maybe even an etching press, you know, it's basically the standard. So if you're, you know, you're, you're doing, you know, wood type, but maybe a, a wood engraving thrown in there, everything's going to be the same height. And that's really important, of course, when you're working with those machines. So something to keep in mind. Um, another great alternative, another great wood to use, something that I've just recently been exploring and trying out, it's holly wood. And uh, holly is, is, you know, in my opinion, I think it's a good alternative because it's not quite as sought after as maple, because even maple, you know, relatively speaking, uh, can be fairly expensive. 
poly isn't really used all that much. And so, you know, if you've got, um, if you can come across, you know, some holly that, you know, from a tree, some, a tree that somebody's cut down or, you know, trimmed up the branches, um, you know, you can, you know, scrounge around and, uh, you know, pick up some of those branches and, and chop that up and, uh, and you've got some really great wood to work with. Um, I've also heard that pear is a good uh, wood to use. I haven't tried it myself. Um, resin grave is another alternative. So resin grave is a synthetic um, material, you know, as the name implies, it's resin, so it's not wood. Um, and apparently it's the closest thing to uh, boxwood that you're going to get without actually using boxwood. Um, so, um, you know, again, a lot of people like it. Uh, I personally, haven't really enjoyed it too much. I, I just like working with wood specifically, um, but it is a really great place to, uh, I would say, start even um, just because, uh, you know, it, it gives you a good amount of resistance. And I think that's important, you know, to achieving a good amount of control when you're working with um, a graver and getting used to it. So let's see here. Uh, one other um uh, alternative, something else you might uh, look into is something called uh, high impact polystyrene. Um, this is something that uh, a wood engraver, Carl Mumford, um, uh, turned me on to. I took a, a wood engraving workshop with him and uh, he mentioned uh, high impact polystyrene as another alternative. Um, that's another sort of material that you can just find that, you know, uh, you know, a plastics store, or you can find it online and it's fairly cheap as well. It's not quite as dense, so it won't really respond quite as well as something like resin grave, but it's another, uh, it's another option for you. So let's see here. All these different, um, well, maple, at least maple blocks, pre-made maple blocks. You can find at uh, McLean's printmaking supply is, uh, where I've, I bought a lot of my printmaking supplies and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today can be found uh, on their website. And I've linked to that in the show notes below as well. All right. So while we're on the topic of blocks, I might as well also mention this tool. This is a heat transfer tool and I've just got the cord wrapped around it here. Um, so when you're going to, to transfer your sketch to your block, if, if you're not drawing and sketching directly onto your block, um, another way to do it is to scan your sketch in and then print your sketch off using a uh, laser printer. Uh, you can't use an inkjet printer because it won't, this transfer method won't work that way. Sorry, use a laser printer. And uh, basically, I don't really have anything kind of set up here as an example, but what you would do is basically, you know, pretend this is the sketch that you printed off. You've cut it down, trimmed it down to the size of your block. You know, you'll lay this down onto the face of your block. And then what you can do is then rub some acetone or some mineral spirits over the back of the paper and then take this heat gun. Uh, you know, of course, once it's heated up and run it over the back here and, and between the heat and the acetone or the mineral spirits that basically releases the toner on the uh, laser printer and transfers the print of your sketch directly to the block and so you'll see an example of of that uh you know the result of that process here in a moment when we you know get to actually engraving on a block that i have uh that i'm working on at the moment uh, in which i've done that same thing so um, this also I've linked uh, to in my show notes, just a heat transfer tool. All right, let's see. So let's get into the gravers a little bit. Um, so I've got a slide here that could be helpful. All right, so this is an example of the various different kinds of tools that are used for wood engraving. So you know, on the left, uh, you know, a tent tool, those are the two uh, tools shown there. Those are typically used just for making very fine straight lines. 
Uh, you're not really going to be doing curves with those. And uh, just the nature of the way those tools are shaped really allow the tool to slide forward in a very straight uh, manner. So um, tent tool, spit sticker. Uh, this tool is a great sort of all around tool. A lot of wood engravers um, will work almost exclusively with, you know, what, what is called a spit sticker here. And um, it basically, it, you know, it allows you to make a very fine line, you know, if you're not pushing too hard into the wood, um, digging too deeply into the wood, or a thicker line if, of course, you apply some more pressure and dig into the wood a little deeper. And so it's very versatile in that way. That way, And, um, you know, of course, you can also use it um, for curves and, um, and things like that. Gravers. Uh, these tools are um, the ones that, you know, someone like uh, Thomas Buick would have been using. And uh, really, these are great as kind of an in-between, between almost a tent tool and a spit sticker in the sense that they allow you to get just a, a really fine uh, amount of detail. Um, but they also allow you to still kind of, uh, you know, get some curves and and, uh, and uh, work around in, in a similar sort of way that a spit sticker would allow you to work. And finally, a scopper. Um, these are just kind of rounded off at the end and allow you to kind of dig in and um, chisel out um, larger sections of uh, space of wood that you need to get rid of. And um, one other tool that isn't really listed here is just a, a, a chisel or a flat graver. And uh, really kind of serves the uh, same purpose, but I've found that uh, scoppers there um, tend to work a little bit better when trying to remove a large amount of material. So this is a, you know, a few illustrations here of how you would hold your tool. Uh, basically, you know, how you're holding the tool is you're wanting to put, you know, kind of the main section, the handle in the palm of your hand. And so basically just like this, you know, wrapping the rest of your fingers around it. And then on the end here, you know, you're really just kind of gripping the sides of the tool. And again, you'll see once I start working, a lot of times the temptation is to put your finger on top of the tool. And, you know, that what that leads to is, is you kind of digging into the block. And really, you know, where all the power is coming from, you know, when you're engraving, all the action is coming from the, should be coming from the palm of your hand. You're really just kind of, the palm of your hand is gliding the tool forward. And, um, you know, you're using your whole, your whole hand to angle things up and down or to dig in and out of the block rather than your finger. And really that's just, uh, because you have a little bit more control that way, um, you know, your finger also can... Uh, sometimes get a bit tired. The tools are, you know, as you can see, fairly thin. And so, you know, over time, if you're, if you've got that finger really pressing down on the top of the tool, it can kind of wear on your finger a bit. Um, all right, let's see here. So gravers, again, um, uh, McLean's printmaking supply is a great place to get uh, gravers like this. Um, a place that I've been getting my gravers from recently um, is, uh, there's a couple different jewelry supply, um, companies, uh, one's Contenti, uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, another one's Rio Grande, Rio Grande, uh, and I've linked to at least one of those down below. So basically, again, those are goldsmithing kind of jewelry supply websites. And, um, so they sell the, the gravers as two separate pieces. So basically you're just buying the metal piece and then you buy, a, a you know, your handle separate. And so you would need to, there's some customization involved, you know, you, you know, might kind of, you'll have to bend, you know, the, uh, angle into your graver here and, uh, you know, kind of whack this handle on the back. But basically that allows you to kind of customize your gravers a little bit more. You can't really do that when you buy the pre-made gravers, you know, from a print printmaking shop. So again, you know, I, I recommend starting with the, you know, the gravers that are prepared specifically for wood engraving, you know, hand in hand with gravers, you know, you can't talk about your tools 
um, without mentioning sharpening, because if you don't have sharp tools, it's uh, it's going to be pretty frustrating. And so, you know, if you're buying gravers, you also need to buy a good oil stone. And also, uh, what I have here is a little Crocker jig, also linked to in the show notes. Um, so basically what this jig allows for is for the tool to sit on top of the stone with the face of the tool, you know, flat, you know, right down on the, on the stone. Um, and then it holds it in place as you're sharpening. Because of course, if you're holding the tool just by hand here and running it over the stone, um, even if you think that you're holding it perfectly still, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to be holding it perfectly still, you know, it's, so this, this jig allows you to get a real nice clean face on the end of your tool and, um, something to look out for. And most stones will have this is a stone that has two sides, uh, with two different, um, grits. So for instance, on this stone, I think this is around a, a hundred grit. And on this side, I think it's around 320 grit. 3.30 or so. I got this one off of Amazon. Um, McLean's has uh, oil stones. Um, but again, the rougher side will allow you to kind of put a new finish on your tool, you know, if, if it has some damage or if you really need to get through a good amount of material. Um, uh, but then, you know, you'll use the finer uh, side to um, really kind of put a polished kind of face on the tool. All right. Um, also, again, before I go too far, before I leave off on sharpening, you also want to get some oil. And uh, typically that's recommended when you're buying um, an oil stone, as the name implies. So make sure you get some oil as well. All right. Um, as you can see here, another thing that you might want to pick up something that makes the whole wood engraving process a little um, easier, a little bit more enjoyable is a sandbag. And so these are a couple sandbags. So the whole point here being that it gives you a nice kind of elevated place to work from, but it also allows you to kind of pivot your block around on top of these sandbags as you're working. Um, you know, if, if, and, and to angle it towards you, you know, if your if your block is just right down on the table, or wherever you're working, um, you know, you just don't have as much flexibility of movement. Uh, because the other thing that you're going to realize as you start to work is that when you're engraving, you actually don't want to do too much with the hand that's holding your graver. You actually want most of the movement to be coming from the hand that's holding your block. So as you're, you know, working into the block, this hand's going to be fairly stationary and this block, this hand holding the block is going to be moving. And so these sandbags allow you to have that nice sort of surface that allows you to pivot, pivot and, and move the block around a bit. Another kind of, I guess you could say almost an upgrade to this, uh, and by no means is it necessary to get started, is what is called uh, an engraver's vise. You can see here, this is, this is an engraver's vise. And, um, basically it, I mean, it does the same thing and more, you know, that the sandbags are doing, uh, it allows you to, you know, grip onto the block that you're working with, but it also spins. And so, you know, uh, you know, sometimes you'll find, you know, as you're working, you know, of course you might make a mistake and you kind of fumble your block. Uh, you know, with a graver's vice, an engraver's vice, you know, you're you're not gonna drop the block. You know, of course, it's it's um, it's clamped into the top here, and it has these little pegs here that kind of serve as kind of claws or teeth that kind of clamp onto the block, and then um, you know, once you're all tightened up, the base of the vice uh, spins. Um, and then it's sitting in um, its own sort of almost like dish, you know, that allows you to kind of pivot and move the angle of the entire vise. I'm not going to move it because I've got it just where I want it. But um, 
so anyways this is really nice it's also uh they're also not cheap and so you know again uh you don't need anything fancy to really get started with wood engraving um but i think again like what you'll find with most things once you get into it uh, you know, you want to have fun with it and you start finding different things that, that make it a little more fun, more interesting. And so, um, for me, uh, something that I've enjoyed is kind of going back to the roots of wood engraving. You know, if it really did start with Thomas Buick and, and, um, and, you know, him being the son of a jeweler, jewelry maker, um, I've been kind of going back to that world and kind of stealing from the tools that they're using. And, you know, an engraver of spice. Uh, this is a tool that, uh, you know, goldsmiths, you know, jewelry makers are using a lot of times. Um, and same with that is a stereo microscope. A lot of uh, jewelry makers are using these. And I'll talk about this here in a moment. But for now, I'll jump back to more basic um, <laughs> equipment. So speaking of magnification, um, you know, if you are looking to magnify what you're working on, a good place to start is to just use a magnifying glass. And that's what I've got here. Um, the angle doesn't really communicate it very well, but it's basically just a mag mic um, magnifying glass that's being held in a stand here. And, um, you know, the, you can find these, uh, you know, just kind of search around online. Um, I found this one on eBay. You know, it's not really a name brand or anything. It's just uh, some old one that somebody was selling. Um, another solution for magnification is a headband magnifier. Uh, basically, you just kind of wear it on your head. I can't fit it over my head right now because I'm wearing headphones. And uh, these lenses, you know, it comes with several different lenses. Um, you know, the greater the magnifying power, the shorter the working distance so keep that in mind but typically these will come with a range of magnification so you can pop a few in and uh, try out what works best for you uh, these are fine uh, but I, I i never really found myself using it that much uh, you can see here that i've got the lenses on this set extended out a little ways i just went to the hardware store and got some uh, you know, a couple little bolts and nuts and um, extended it out. And basically that increased my working distance a little bit by pulling the lenses away from my eyes. So yeah, th these are a good option. All right. So then the stereo microscope, again, um, these are great in the sense that, you know, it gives you a, a greater range of magnification. It also gives you... Um, uh, it's a little easier on the eyes because, you know, you're looking through two eye ports. Um, a lot of times you'll find that when you're using um, a magnifying glass is that, you know, your eyes are having to travel down through this magnifying glass. And if you're not centered up just right on the, on the magnifying glass, or if it's too small, this one's a bit small. Um, you know, if you close one eye and, you know, it's looking through the middle of the mag magnifying glass and you kind of close the other eye, sometimes you'll find that that eye is actually hitting the edge of the magnifying glass. So when you have both eyes open, that can kind of create for some blurry vision or some uh, kind of strain on the eyes. So a stereo microscope helps kind of cut out on a lot of those sorts of issues. Um, and there's a whole range of, of stereo microscopes that you can uh, get there's a lot out there um, this one is a an old Leica stereo microscope it's a, specifically a stereo zoom six um, I think I think Leica bought a company called Bosch and Lomb um, and they made uh, this basically this exact same stereo microscope for a long time before I think Leica wound up buying them out and um, uh, so anyways, that, that's that's one to check out if, if I, I think, you know, from what I've heard and from what I've experienced, it seems like a good starter stereo microscope. Um, and of course, they get fancier and more elaborate from here. Um, printing, I'm just going to very, very quickly hit on printing uh, just because we're not going to be doing any of that today. Uh, maybe I'll do a, um, a session on that specifically in the future. 
but um, you know, I, you know, just in the studio here, um, if I'm doing any kind of printing at all, it's just by hand, just doing a little test print, doing a few test prints, you know, to sell in my online store or whatever. Um, and so what I've been using is this uh, Baron that actually, you know, kind of drew up a design for and sent it to my brother who does work on a lathe. Um, but you can find Barons, um, you know, online, you know, I think, again, McLean's, I think sells a Baron. Um, it's like a palm Baron that, uh, seems like it would work pretty good. Um, this one I designed specifically because I had been using a Baron that wasn't technically a Baron. It was just some random tool that I found at an estate sale that was working pretty great for that same purpose. The purpose being, you know, when you lay your, you ink up your block with a roller, you lay the paper down over the top of your block, and then a baron basically is what you would then hold on to to go over that piece of paper and apply pressure to transfer the the ink, you know, through the pressure that you're applying to the paper. And so anyway, um, so yeah, again, I'll hit on printing maybe more in the future, at least doing, um, uh, you know, kind of test prints or prints by hand. Um, because of course, if you were going to do a larger run of prints, you would then take your block to a letterpress, uh, you know, shop or somebody that has an etching press. And, um, you know, again, maybe in the future, I'll talk about, you know, the, the, the differences between those different types of printers or, or even a hand press. Um, all right. Well, let's get into actually working on an engraving. So here's a wood engraving that I've been working on lately. I'm just using my iPhone, so you'll have to, again, bear with the on-screen kind of graphics there. All right. So as you can see, right now I'm working on uh, the chest here of the bird. And you can also see the transfer method that I used that I was mentioning earlier, how I printed um, printed off the image, you know, with a laser printer and then transferred that print to the block. And so what I've done next is to coat my block in um, uh, some ink. You know, a lot of times people will use a dark wash of India ink. You want to make sure you kind of dilute it so that you don't just coat your cover, your sketch in black and you can't see it anymore. Um, if you dilute it a bit so that it's kind of a gray, uh, then you can see your sketch, of course, through the ink. Now, what I've done is used some, you know, oil-based printmaking ink uh, that I diluted with some mineral spirits and then washed over the top of the block. And so basically what that does is, you know, as you're working, it, it allows you to see what you've taken away. Because otherwise, you know, of course, the block would be the same color on the surface as it is, you know, just under the surface. And so as I'm engraving, it would be hard to tell where I've, what I've done. You know, at this point, I'll probably just kind of work for a little bit and just kind of share as things come to mind. Um, just because in a large way, at this point, it's all just about kind of learning by doing or watching or just kind of experiencing it yourself. There are things that can be kind of described or explained, but it isn't until you really kind of pick up a, a tool, a graver, and start engraving into a block of wood that you really start to understand, you know, what people are talking about, even if you are reading about it or hearing somebody talk about it. But that being said, you know, one consideration, one thing that I learned, you know, as I started engraving is, well, one of the mistakes that I think I was making at, at first was that, you know, when I was looking at other people's engravings, 
and you just look at all of the lines and the engraving and and you know if the engraver is skilled you know and has done their job well like anything that's been done skillfully you know they're going to make it look like it was done very easily and you know very kind of naturally and all at once you know uh, but as you can see you know each of these strokes they're not really happening in one stroke you know when i was first getting started again i, I would have expected these to just be whoosh, you know each one of these strokes to have been just pushed through all at once but as you can see what i'm doing really is kind of moving forward and then coming back and moving forward and coming back and basically what i'm doing there is is checking where i'm at to make sure that i'm not you know veering off course too much gives me a chance to kind of course correct a little bit and another thing to consider to think about is that rather than rather than kind of making your lines exactly as as kind of wide and bold and you know as you want them to be right away typically what you want to do is you want to start with kind of a faint line a thinner line and then go back in and go back into that same line and open it up a bit more until you've got it at just the right width that you want it to be another thing that i tried doing at the beginning was kind of almost mapping out all of my lines uh, before then going back in and widening those lines out. And uh, what I found that that often did, it, it often just obscured my sketch. And so once I, I you know, started going back in to kind of widen out all of those lines that I mapped out, I had kind of lost all of the, you know, again, lost the sketch underneath and um, and so it made it a little bit more difficult. So what I've been doing here is just been taking it one line at a time. But again, even a lot of what I'm saying here, it's you know it's hard to really convey unless you you know what I'm talking about to some degree or another. You know, so as I'm working, I'm also kind of stopping and, and looking at where I need to be. You know, I'm always thinking about, you know, are my lines following the contour of whatever it is that I'm, I'm illustrating here, you know? And so you can see right now that my line is coming down out of the neck, uh, but then it's got a bit of a sharp apex before it then starts to curl around you know the front of this bird's belly and so i want to i want to fix that you know i don't want to have this flat sort of uh line running from you know the top of the chest of the bird down to where the legs would be you know i want that to be a nice you know sweeping contour to match the natural contour of the bird's breast there so i mean there's nothing i can do to what i <laughs> to, to fix what i've already done here but but I can't start to course correct, you know, with my uh, with the next few lines that I do. So I can start by opening up the bottom side of the last line that I did. It'll do a little something for me. But then instead of starting my next line up at the top, I'm going to start it about midway down the front of the bird. So that now, 
when I go to make my next line, I will start back up at the top again. And what that line that I just made down at the bottom allows for is for this next stroke to be a slightly more slightly more of a swooping kind of a sweeping stroke to eliminate a bit of that flat face that I was getting on the front of the bird. Now you can see, you know, on that leading edge of my strokes here, by what I did in the, in the stroke previous to the one I just did, it allowed me to get a little bit more of a curve in. So that as I work my way around, you know, I'm going to have to keep making some of those adjusting kind of strokes in order to make it so that by the time I I get to the back or the right side of the chest of the bird here. I'm then able to match kind of the natural kind of direction that the feathers would be going as they kind of rise and sweep back towards the wings. All right. Well, that's about it for now. Thanks for watching and um, I'll uh, catch you all in a, Future, future session. All right, bye.